So, okay. Um, anyways, our guest today is uh, Bill Carley, V4 uh, Kilo Zulu, and uh, he's been continuously licensed since 1957. Uh, he's held the calls K8 Quebec Golf Tango, Victor Echo 2 Echo Charlie Whiskey, and briefly as uh, Four Sugar 7 Kilo Zulu Germany in Sri Lanka, and of course presently uh, advanced class license of uh, VE4 uh, KZ. His amateur radio interests include propagation, antennas, digimodes, and DXing. Bill's articles on these and other matters of interest to hams have appeared in CQ Magazine and the Canadian Amateur. That's the uh, uh, publication of the uh, Radio Amateurs of uh, Canada Incorporated. So if Bill's call is familiar, that's probably where you saw it before in uh, one of those publications. Um, he's earned several operating and contesting awards, including DXCC. He's a certified emergency coordinator. Uh, he's also retired uh, following a career in international consulting, university teaching, and university administration. So uh, we're glad to have Bill here today as we talked about this. Uh, we said for most of us, we're starting to uh, see signs of winter letting up, although I'm sure in Bill's case up in Manitoba, it may not be so obvious yet. But um, we wanted to go ahead and do this uh, presentation so it uh, gets you thinking about uh, maybe some antenna projects and things you want to do once the uh, weather does start to uh, warm up with you, for you. So with that, Bill, uh, why don't you go ahead and take it. The floor is yours, and uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot, Ken, and do appreciate the uh, introduction. Hello to everybody out there uh, who are listening and viewing today, and to all those of you who might uh, uh, take the opportunity to view this uh, later on via YouTube. We are talking today about antenna system planning, so we're going to go through a, uh, a planning exercise, and hope we can use some of these uh, points when you're planning uh, your own antenna systems. So this is the shack that you can see there on the uh, left and uh, as uh, uh, Ken mentioned uh, I might not be doing any antenna work too soon because this is what I see out the uh, shack window. The uh, snow out there is about uh, three feet uh, in places on the flat, a little higher in other places, so about a meter deep on average throughout the yard. Uh, before getting too far into this, let's set the uh, stage of uh, uh, the exercise today. Um, we have in Canada a coast-to-coast -coast 80 meter single sideband net and we use uh, three host stations. Mostly these host stations are towards the central part of Canada and their challenge is to uh, be able to uh, act as net control and to work uh, both coasts and everything in between and also from the US border up to the Arctic and occasionally we get some uh, US stations uh, that check in and even now and then some folks uh, check in from England. So to get an idea of what we're talking about here's an azimuthal map of uh, North America this is where VE4KZ is located right here and this is Lake uh, Winnipeg this is the 10th largest body of fresh water in the world. It's a quite long lake. And uh, this whole area along here uh, is glacial moraine. So it's uh, material that's uh, sand and gravel and it runs in undulating hills uh, all the way from uh, this area on up into Hudson Bay. And the, uh, the challenge is to work coast to coast, so from here all the way out to the uh, Atlantic, to Newfoundland, which is located right here, all the way out the other direction as far as uh, uh, Vancouver Island's uh, northern part and up into uh, the rest of northern British Columbia, and also up into the uh, Northwestern Territories and the Yukon. This is a, a couple thousand miles of this direction, about 3,000 kilometers this way, about the same distance this way, and slightly shorter going this way. And as I mentioned, we usually have uh, involved three host stations. One is down in this area. One is here, uh, VE4KZ, and then one here in uh, Saskatchewan. So the host station for this nightly single sideband net needs to work both coast and all in between. As I mentioned, there's three of them and where they're located. Their characteristics are high effective radiated power and good listening conditions. 
And the way we get the high effective radiated power, of course, is with uh, linear amplifiers, typically giving the, the 1400 watt ERP range. But, you know, it's just not uh, power. You've got to be able to radiate it, so you need a fairly good uh, antenna system. And you need good listening conditions. Uh, being located uh, within a city uh, does not work too well in that direction. I'm out in the rural area, so it's quite quiet. And the other two stations are also in rural areas, so they can uh, hear quite well. Nevertheless, there is some noise that comes in from the south because about uh, 115 kilometers south of me is the city of Winnipeg. And further south, another 100 kilometers uh, begins the U.S. border and the stations uh, down there. So um, one of the issues here is uh, not listening to all the noise that comes from the south, including the thunderstorms that go roaring through uh, the Gulf of Mexico at this time of the year and uh, uh, across the uh, tornado, tornado alley in the central part of the United States. Now, when I first got involved as a host station, um, certainly I had an antenna up. Certainly I had about uh, 700 uh, to 800 uh, uh, watts output uh, on the uh, peaks but it just was not enough effective radiated power. So I changed the amp and still didn't have just enough ERP, nor was the listening good enough. So we had to solve those kind of problems, and that's the uh, context in which we were working, and we're going to talk about uh, today. So to do that, uh, I like to apply the systems approach, and we'll focus a lot today on the systems approach to doing things. We'll define it first of all, and then uh, consider what it's like and apply it to uh, ham radio exercise here. Um, we'll define the problem. Of course, that's to get better signal in preferred directions. The solutions, we'll look at several solutions that were identified as being the ones that would work, and then picking one that would be the ideal. We'll talk a little bit about the construction and installation, but very, very little about that. Uh, it's more about the systems approach. I'll talk about the performance the uh, antenna actually built, and then we'll wrap up and turn the floor back over to uh, Ken and to yourselves. So what is a uh, system? Well, you can think of it in two ways. First, as a set of uh, connected things or parts that are forming a complex whole. For example, if you uh, consider the automobile, there's several uh, systems there. There's the power system, and then there's the transmission system. Of course, there's the frame and, and the body, also systems. Then you've got all those protective systems, such as the airbag systems, and of course, the uh, systems that you use to monitor the function of the uh, engine to measure your speed, in other words, the instrumentation systems. I'm sure you can think of other examples of uh, things or parts that are forming a more complex whole, that being a system. The other way looking at a system is a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done. Again, using the automobile example, there's principles and procedures of how do you drive a car, of course. You get in, you start the automobile, you put it in gear, and now you navigate it throughout the city or in the country according to certain rules and regulations. You know what a stop sign means. So that's part of a system of rules and procedures according to which something is done. When we think about uh, telecommunications, these are the parts of a telecommunication system, a transmitter, a receiver, some kind of medium. And the way the uh, system works when you start to analyze it, and that's what we want to do is analyze what's in the system, we start out with the fact that there's a, a fellow here who's got an idea in his head that he wants to get over here into this person's head. So he'll encode it in some way, first in some kind of language that he might speak through a microphone into his transmitter, or he might use his key or keyer turn it into Morse code to modulate his transmitter, or he might actually sit at a keyboard and type it in using one of the digital modes like PSK or JT65 or what have you. The idea is to modulate the transmitter with uh, the code representing his idea. It then gets through his transmitter, 
It goes up the antenna and radiates into space using electromagnetic waves and goes through some medium that carries these electromagnetic waves. As HF operators, we're most concerned about the medium that is the ionosphere, several hundred uh, kilometers above Earth, where we can actually refract signals and make them bounce between the refractive layer and the Earth. And with one, two, three, four, five bounces, get halfway around the world. So that's the medium we most often think about as the being the ionosphere. If we're considering point-to-point uh, -point communication, it might be through the troposphere where the signals just go line of sight, or maybe are slightly bent by inversions. Certainly, these are the kinds of situations or the kind of media that apply to the folks among our group here that use VHF, UHF, and microwaves. The point is, sooner or later, the signal gets to this receiver, where it's then decoded in his head through his equipment and forms the same idea, if everything went well, the same idea that this fellow had when he started transmitting. Of course, if there's a lot of noise in the system here, the idea received gets somewhat garbled. So let's uh, think of another medium. You can hear the phone ringing in the background. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, we won't answer that right now. <laughs> let's move on then to uh, looking more closely at the system itself. Uh, of course, it involves you. There you are. And uh, the things that you want to do with the system. But you're a key part of it, obviously. Things like your practices, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, how you use your equipment, uh, how you select your uh, modes, um, your preferences. These are things that you think about. Those of you out there who are contest operators uh, know a lot about your practices and your skills. You've honed them over the years and uh, learned a lot so that you can actually then massage your hardware and software and select your mode so that you can do the best with the system that's available to you in order to, uh, to communicate. And again, just to emphasize a little bit, the hardware we have, which we so often focus on this, is not the only thing in the system. There are some important things here. So we have our hardware, our transceivers, our receivers, our transmitters, our antennas, and so forth. Some of us have various kinds of software that we also use, maybe to control the rig, uh, perhaps to log. A lot of us use logging software. And uh, some don't. They write it down in a paper log. But it changes how you operate the system, and it's a part of your system. Finally, there's the mode. We select the mode that we think is best for the option or the problem that we're dealing with. Maybe CW because we know it's going to get through and there's a lot of noise and uh, QRN, QR Mary, QSB. Or we might pick a digital mode, uh, JT65, that works very well below the noise level. Another part of our system is the location, especially the terrain that's maybe 10 wavelengths away from the antenna and the terrain very close to the antenna. Let's talk about the one furthest away. First of all, that's the one that's most going to, going to affect how your signal radiates uh, into the ionosphere. The uh, terrain close to your antenna is going to determine, in the case of vertical antennas, how much your losses are uh, through ground losses in the, uh, uh, in the nearby uh, area around the antenna via the uh, radial system. We all dream of uh, picking a location that is, you know, uh, a desert island uh, with high above uh, uh, the average terrain, high above the average sea level, preferably the sea with a saltwater base. We think that's the best way to uh, get our antenna in the air and have a really wonderful ref reflecting layer for our signals to be launched further up to the uh, ionosphere. And speaking of the ionosphere, the propagation medium is part of the system. Over the years, uh, we've become aware of this as uh, young hams. And as we get uh, older, we might learn a little bit more detail about it. And sometimes uh, the contesters and the DXers out there among you will nod your head at this. 
we get to know quite a bit about when to transmit, when to receive, and it's based upon the vagaries of the propagation medium. That is, which layer can we use at this time of the day? Uh, what happens if we've had some kind of solar disturbance? Does it affect the propagation medium? We know these things. We know where to get the data. We know how to apply it. And it becomes part of the system, something that we understand and we can maybe even do something about by selecting the right time of day, the year, and so forth. So in the system, at your end, are all these things to be considered. Meanwhile, at the other end, the guy or gal, at the other end of the link, the same things apply. So you could actually think of reproducing these again as parts of the system that uh, are in the communications path, in the communications circuit. Now, in truth, you and I probably can only control the terrain, that is where we want to put our antennas, what kind of antenna we're going to use, and the medium as to whether we're going to use the uh, F2 layer, the F1 layer, or if we're into 10 meters and 6 meters, the E layer for sporadic E communications and so on. And in fact, uh, the rest of uh, this uh, presentation, we'll be talking a, a lot about these topics as a focus in the system and things that uh, these are things you can act upon fairly quickly and easily. So terrain and antenna especially will be focused in the next little bit. So let's uh, look at this situation that we were in a little bit more detail. And again, this is VE4KZ in the middle of Canada. And in this powwow club that meets every night on uh, 3750 in the 80 meter band, starting at 0500 UTC, uh, for example, uh, uh, tonight, switching over to 0400 tomorrow night once daylight saving time goes into effect in uh, Canada, um, we have to cover an area like this. Here's Newfoundland out in the Atlantic Ocean, and one of our stations that checks in is in St. John's. We have another one up in, here in Cape de Verde. Uh, I'm just going to mark St. John's for conversation purposes. So that's about the furthest east. And as you look here, the uh, azimuthal direction from VE4KZ is about 90 my, and then down to 80. So about 80 degrees here. And by the way, we get to the tip of Newfoundland at someplace around 73 degrees or so. So roughly we'll say about 77 degrees is the azimuthal direction in true bearing, the true bearing from here to there. We also have Stason checking in from Halifax in Nova Scotia and from Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I think out there listening is VE1 Alpha Kilo Tango. Uh, hello to you, Al. And we have stations also here in Montreal, Quebec, over here in uh, the uh, Ottawa, Ontario area and stations down here from uh, Toronto all the way down to Windsor, Ontario, and up along here to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and Thunder Bay and Red Lake, Ontario. Now the most furthest south going east, the most furthest southeast you can see is about here. And again, if we measure the bearing, it's about 90, 100, 110, about 120 degrees true from VE4KZ. So the radiation angle that we would want to send radiation out is going to run approximately in these, these bearings someplace in here. If we are looking to the west, we have stations. These are the ones most south and the ones most north. And we see they're about 270 degrees true, all the way up to 300 and about 20 degrees true. This direction is 3,000 or uh, kilometers, 2,000 miles. This direction is about 2,500 
uh, miles in this direction. We occasionally get stations checking in down here in the United States, uh, depending on conditions, but the main focus is in this direction, in this direction, and in that width of coverage. So this is part of the systematic design of an antenna system is where do you have to communicate? And we've just uh, described that and we can then ask ourselves how can we reach those locations? Now many of you have seen this drawing for or table for many many years in the uh, antenna handbook. It's a good place to start to figure out uh, what radiation angle out of your antenna you will need in order to reach those locations. Let me look, take a look at the uh, table with you or the graph with you. This is the maximum height of the F2 layer at about 261 miles above the surface of the Earth, depending on the amount of radiation that the Sun is making available to us. This is the lowest height, about 131 miles. So in this range, we can figure out that that's roughly where the ionosphere is at various times of the day and night. During the daytime, the F1 layer is down here, but as you know, after night, this collapses into the F2 layer. So let's see how we would use this uh, table. Let's say that we wanted to go cover a distance of about 1,250 miles for a single hop distance, maybe 1,300, and we'd run the line up here to the top of the F2 layer, and then we would go across here, and we see that the radiation angle and degrees above the horizon from, let's say, my antenna, would be about 30 degrees. So I'd launch a signal at that angle, and it would go and hit the F2 layer at its maximum height, be refracted down to Earth, approximately 1,250 to 1,300 miles away on a single hop distance. Let's say the uh, we're looking at the bottom of the F2 layer. We go up from the 1250, go across, and we see it's roughly about 17 degrees, 18 degrees. Bear in mind this is logarithmic scale, so you have to make a little different estimating here <laughs> than just dividing things uh, equally. So we see it's roughly maybe 17 degrees. Uh, launch angle would hit this, bottom of the F2 layer, and then refract it down. I like to do this and then just split the difference between the two and say, well, the average is someplace in here. I'm going to shoot it out here, hit that, and then go through. What about uh, something that uh, is not as, as uh, but something that's a little further away, let's say 2,000 miles. So do the same process again up here, zoom across, uh, looks like maybe 13, 14 degrees. And if it's hitting the bottom of the layer, someplace around four and a half, 4.3 degrees. So now we know our targets and we know also what launch angles we need in order to radi radiate a signal to the F2 layer, refract it through the F2 layer, and have the signal come down at distance that we uh, know that we must go. Now let's summarize that into this table. Okay, so these are target area measurements relative to VE4KZ. Here's VE4KZ in the middle in Bel Air, Manitoba. This is east of me. This is west of me. Um, the um, headings are target area centered on some city in that area the bearing in degrees true, the distance in kilometers and in statute miles, the one skip elevation angle, the highest uh, and lowest angles and the median, and then this two skip elevation angle. And we're going to look at the one skips first and I'll come back and explain this part in a moment. So let's say we want to go out to Newfoundland, way out there on the uh, east part of Canada, out in the uh, North Atlantic. Well, the bearing is about 77 degrees true. The distance in kilometers is 3,220 kilometers, and it's 2,000 statute miles. The one skip elevation angle, using that 
uh, table using this table, or I should say using this graph, means that we would have a one skip elevation angle of 0 0.5 to 17 degrees above my horizon for a medium of about, medium of about 11 to get to St. John's. Now if I took something like, oh, let's say Toronto, which is not as far away, in fact it's about half the distance, its bearing is 120 degrees, true, distance about 1,521 kilometers, 945 statute miles, and this is all airline distances, direct line distances. The one skip elevation angle ranges between 20 and 36 degrees, with uh, 28 degrees being the median. What about Thunder Bay, Ontario? Thunder Bay is quite close to me. It's only 588 kilometers away. And it turns out that if I tried to use that uh, chart earlier, it would suggest an elevation angle of, of almost uh, up 80 degrees or 75 degrees in order to bounce back down into Thunder Bay. Hence, I would think that I have to use a near vertical incidence uh, type of uh, radiation system uh, to reach Thunder Bay. And for stations closer, let's say stations down in Winnipeg, about 115 kilometers away, or over to Brandon, Manitoba, which is uh, uh, about twice as far away, uh, or three times as far away, I might be able to cover them on ground wave. So they might not be hearing me via a, a sky wave, but hearing me via a ground wave. Let's go now to the west, and we won't uh, spend a lot of time on this because we now know how to use this chart. So let's say Prince Rupert, British Columbia up around 294 degrees uh, uh, bearing, uh, true bearing, 2300 uh, kilometers. And the radiation goes between 11 and 27 for about 19 is the median. If we talk about somebody uh, somewhat closer, Calgary, Alberta, and you can see now the angle is getting somewhat higher as it gets closer to me. Saskatoon in the neighboring province of Saskatchewan, about 741 kilometers. And now we're thinking about a radiation angle about maybe 45 degrees to nearly straight up. So I'm just picked a number around 68 degrees as being the one that would land a signal with one skip into Saskatoon. Now I told you that there would be some discussion about maybe using two skips to get there, and I'll now demonstrate the reason for that. Here's VE4KZ located near Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg is about 230 meters above sea level. VE4KZ is 250 meters above sea level. So any antenna I put up is uh, above average terrain in this direction automatically 20 meters in the air, even if it's laying on the ground. Of course, once it's up on a tower or in the trees, and I've got a lot of trees here, uh, the antenna now is uh, uh, approaching a quite high elevation above the average terrain that goes this way across the lake. And this extends hundreds of miles, hundreds of uh, kilometers before the land starts rising again. But here's my problem when I'm trying to go to the east. Within about 750 meters of my QTH, the elevation is 283 meters above sea level. So in other words, in this little distance, the land rises the difference between 283 and 250 or about 33 meters or about 100 feet. And then the land drops down again and comes back up again and down again and then it gets quite low again here. This is sort of swampy land here. So here's a side view of my situation. Lake Winnipeg. Land rises up. There's a road here running along the lakeshore rises up again a little bit, and here's VE4KZ. Looking out this way, it's a very nice shot. I'm 
really high above the surrounding terrain going that way. I must also tell you that coming out of the page, which is south, the land drops off very nicely, so I have good radiation to the uh, southwest and south. And going the other way into the page, which is to the north, I have good radiation to the north and also to the northwest. But the problem this way is towards the east. The land rises quite rapidly. So if I cannot shoot radiation at zero degrees. It just gets absorbed on the granular material that makes the glacial moraine. In fact, to get over this average terrain here, I have to think about radiation angles higher than about 20 degrees. Hence, we come back to the target area measurements and this two-skip issue. Remember, I have to be above about 22 degrees. So I can't use these elevations to go into St. John's or to go into Halifax. I have to think about a two-skip elevation. So instead of trying to reach 3,220 3, kilometers in one shot, you have to split that in half. Well, let's see what that would be. Here's something about half that, 1,500 suggests about 20 to 36 degrees, so I just transfer that up in this neck of the woods here, and we'll see yeah, that two skip elevation angle is going to be about 28 degrees to hit this target. If that rising terrain were not there, we'd be talking about this elevation angle. Same thing for Halifax. I cannot use uh, the single skip elevation, so let's find something that's half of 25. Well, here's something around 1,200. We're looking at 22 to 40 degrees elevation average or a median of 31. So plug that number up there. So I'm going to have to use two skips to get to Halifax and two skips to get to St. John's, probably one skip for Montreal, Toronto, and ground wave or Nivis for Thunder Bay. And going the other direction, it's all going to be one skip. So this now gets entered into the problem of selecting the antenna. We're going to be looking for an antenna that's going to radiate at its highest, maybe 31 degrees elevation, and probably at its lowest, someplace down around 16. And those of you out there who have been playing with antennas a long time know that the uh, vertical antenna is the one that's going to give you a, a low elevation on the 80-meter uh, band, the 40-meter band, the 30-meter band. And the other bands, of course, you can just get the antenna high in the air, a half wavelength or more in the air, and you're going to get that low angle uh, radiation. Now to orientate uh, ourselves a little bit, here's the, the property that uh, VE4KZ re resides. And uh, at the front, it's about 30 meters across here, about twice that along the back. And it's sort of a pie-shaped wedge. 60 meters this way, 61 meters, 61 meters. This is the uh, house. And these little asterisks, these little features here, these are small trees, small trees. And the bigger ones are big trees. And then by big trees, I mean 50 feet, 60 feet high. Some back here are in the 70-foot uh, range. So with that in mind, uh, uh, you can realize that it is possible to put in this property a single 80 meter vertical and have its radials running out and everything will be uh, uh, as good as it might be for an amateur radio installation or perhaps even optimal for an amateur radio station, installation. You can imagine being able to put in uh, 60 some verticals uh, in that back, uh, 60 some radials in that backyard. As a matter of fact, at this point, we have actually mounted 10 meters, correction, 3 meters above ground, 10 feet above ground, uh, right about uh, in here is the ground plane vertical that's uh, a butternut vertical, all band vertical, but it's uh, on uh, elevated radials, and the radials run out in the air across this yard area. And uh, it's the antenna that was originally used on this uh, 80 meter net. So the candidate antennas uh, uh, we can now consider. We know uh, what uh, radiation angle we need. And uh, so we have a ground plane vertical already in place out there. And we also had an inverted V uh, hanging on the uh, television tower on the side of the house. Uh, those two just were not uh, as good as they might be in terms of, uh, in terms of effective radiative power. Another choice would have been to 
let's put up a conventional dipole. Let's see how high we can get it. But even at 60 feet up, it's not going to be a grand antenna on 80 meters. The other antenna that came to mind was the half square vertical array. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But it's a vertical array of two verticals. And uh, it provides you, as verticals do, with low angle radiation. The nice thing about it as well is that it's not omnidirectional, it is bidirectional. Another possibility for the property was a phased two element of vertical array uh, that would also act like the half square array in terms of providing either a bidirectional array or even better, if spaced a quarter wave apart, the two elements would make a cardioid pattern that could then be switched between uh, the east direction and the west direction. In fact, uh, we have some members of the uh, Powwow Club that do indeed have that kind of array. Another possibility was the four uh, square array, the phased four element vertical array. The problem with that antenna is it's just too large with its radial system to fit in the property that I have uh, without putting radials on my neighbor's property and out in the road. So I don't think that's going to happen. And the phase two element vertical array just above that, uh, similar problem with enough space for radials uh, given uh, where I thought it was going to put it. So I think those two are just taken off the list and the candidate antennas uh, remain the ground plane vertical, the inverted V, a conventional dipole and the uh, half square vertical array. And before we get too far, this is what the half square looks like in case you haven't used one before and we'll talk more about it in a minute. Uh, this is a vertical element made out of wire one quarter wave long, another one over here one quarter, quarter wave long. This is copper wire running across here. The two elements are spaced one half wave. You can feed it here or feed it here. You feed it, if you feed it here, it's a low Z, low impedance point. You feed it down here, it's a high Z impedance point, high impedance point. If you feed it here, you need some kind of uh, counterpoise system. And we'll come back to this antenna in more detail. Its radiation pattern, though, is like a vertical. It's got most of its radiation down in the lower elevation angles above the horizon. Let us compare that momentarily to the other antennas. So here's the half square array. Here's the ground plane vertical that I had in place at the time. It's also low radiation angle, but look how much less signal than the half square. We're talking a difference here of, let's see, this is around minus 9 dB relative to minus 4 dB. So this is about 5 dB down from the half square. Here's the uh, conventional dipole. It has its radiation quite a bit straight up in the air. It's otherwise known as a cloud warmer. Uh, and then the uh, inverted V here, a little less radiation in all directions uh, above the horizon. But those are the, the kind of radiation patterns that you want to look at when you're going through this systematically. And clearly, uh, uh, for long range, we need to use one of these two verticals. And we know this ground plane just was not uh, doing the job, so we had to think about this antenna. So very quickly, we'll just put all those antennas together here on this chart. Here's the ground plane vertical. It's 10 feet above ground, and its elevation, its, its gain in DBI at 20 degrees above the horizon is a losser. It's a losing element. It's, it's, it's a, a resistor. Minus 1.9 dB uh, DBI radiation at that angle. And at 40 degrees above the horizon at minus 36. So you can see it's, it's got low angle radiation, but uh, it's actually a lossy device. The inverted V dipole that was also up at the time at 15 meters uh, has more of its radiation above the horizon than at the low angles. And the conventional dipole, this is a candidate that we might want to put up, does a little bit better than the inverted V. 
uh, but again, it's elevation uh, radiation. The radiation elevation is a little too high for what we want to do. However, that half square, if we put that up at 50 meters, we have very good low uh, angle radiation. 3.5 dBi compared to what I had in place at the time, minus 1.9. The difference between these two, two numbers is almost an S unit difference between these two numbers at 20, 30 degrees elevation between the existing antenna and the half square, almost an S unit. So clearly the half square is really performing quite well. And this was all modeled with EasyNEC 5, which some of you are aware of, and using uh, 6 millisiemens per meter as the ground conductivity and the dielectric constant of 13. In other words, a mixture of uh, sandy soil and a little bit of uh, uh, soil, a uh, correction, a little bit of uh, forest overburden. We could do some pros and cons of these antennas, but just very quickly, let's uh, see the things that are in, important uh, for our conversation and for me who tried to set up an operation that would be a good net control station. Well, the ground plane vertical we know was, was, was not uh, uh, doing the job. But it was in place. It didn't have to do any more work for it. One of the problems with it, this vertical is that it's omnidirectional. So I hear noise from the south, other stations, and QR November. And that is coming from the city of Winnipeg, the city of Selkirk, both south of me. And of course, in uh, uh, at various times of the year when there's contests on, uh, I can hear all of the United States uh, coming through from the south, and uh, no way to tune it out. Um, so uh, verticals are nice for low angle radiation, but uh, being omnidirectional, they do provide some uh, problems, uh, particularly uh, when you can't aim the signal where you want it to go, and you can't not listen to stuff coming from directions you don't want to listen to. The inverted V, which was also up at the time, has a little bit of gain, but it's insignificant over the ground plane antenna at the 20 and 30 degree elevation angles. At this height, it's omnidirectional uh, too, so, you know, gee whiz, it's uh, not much of an improvement over the ground plane uh, vertical. Remember the conventional dipole at 15 meters was also uh, a candidate antenna. Uh, one of the pros for this antenna uh, in its favor is that it, it's somewhat bidirectional. It's got a 70 B front to side ratio at 30 degrees elevation angle above the horizon. So the noise that would be coming from uh, the uh, uh, off axis uh, from the antenna would be slightly attenuated. So the QR November and the QR Mary uh, would be somewhat uh, uh, reduced. If we come down here to the half square away, array at 50 meters, it's got uh, folded uh, vertical elements. And I will uh, uh, talk a little bit more about that in a moment, this folded aspect. But in any case, on the pro side, it's got more gain at elevation angles at and below 20 degrees than any of the antennas we're talking about. It's also bidirectional. That is, it's got 12 dB front to side ratio at 30 degrees elevation. So noise and signals from the south will be attenuated by almost two S units. One of the things I found out is that if I make it in the bent form, and I'll show you that in a minute, it becomes mechanically complex in a folded form. The other problem for it on the con side is it's not useful for near stations such as in Manitoba and northwestern Ontario. Nevertheless, this became the uh, candidate antenna that became the selected antenna. And here's what mine actually, uh, correction, not mine, but what it would look like if it was a full size. This is a quarter wave, so about 20 meters at 80 meters. And it's a piece of number 12 wire that comes up here. It goes through an insulator that has uh, a connection to a tree through a halyard system and a counterweight system. So when the tree moves, uh, this halyard can move up and down and, and won't be pulling the antenna up and down. So the wire goes up the 20 meters, goes through the insulator, 
it's prevented from sliding through the insulator. It's tied, it's tied there. It goes across 40 meters. It's tied to a feed point insulator, and I'll show you that in the next picture. And then there's another 20 meters of wire coming down this way. And there's insulators at this end and at this end. These are high voltage points, and if you're running a uh, kilowatt, you can imagine it's very high voltage, so you've got to protect that from people and animals and materials. Another way of feeding this antenna is to just run a continuous piece of copper wire in that upside down U shape, and at this point put a parallel tuned circuit resonant at the operating frequency and feed that. You'll have to tap on the coil. And uh, if you feed it at this high impedance point, you will need then to put in some kind of radial system, just some small counterpoise that you could put in there to work it against ground. Now, I could not get that 20 meters of height that I needed, nor uh, enough clearance to keep it away from the house and animals and, and me walking underneath the antenna. So I bent mine. Here's one vertical element. It comes down about 10 or you know, almost 11 uh, meters. Then it's bent through an insulator and goes this way. It's got a, a uh, insulator here and then a spring to hold it taut. Same thing over here. It comes down about 11 meters, goes over 9 meters this way. Insulator spring on it to keep this taut. Remember, this is hooked up in the tree through a hal correction. <laughs> I've got to go back through a halyard system, and here the same idea of through a halyard system with a counterweight. This feed point was made out of a piece of plumbing uh, material. It's uh, PVC, pile polyvinyl chloride, PVC plastic. So the T. This is the 40 meter piece going off this way. This is the 20 meter piece going down this way. This is the RG8U coax coming in here. The center conductor is attached to the vertical element. The shield goes to this element that's feeding the other vertical element. And this uh, rope here then goes off about uh, something on the order of about four meters to uh, a pulley and then down through the pulley to uh, counterweights. So I use two trees, these halyards, some counterweights and tensioners that we've already talked about. And it was run from this tree and uh, off to this tree in the background. So it's radiating this way and radiating that way, east, west. The uh, transmission line came off a branch this way, then dropped straight down to the eave trough of uh, the house. Right there was uh, about 12 turns of the coaxial feed line uh, coiled up to make a uh, coil that was about 12 inches in diameter, sort of a, uh, a, a, an RF choke to uh, remove any uh, common mode currents on the outside of the coax, and then the coax ran along the eave trough, around here, and then into the shack. So how did the antenna perform? Um, these are the measured performance. The dots here are the actual measured SWR. Now let me tell you briefly how that was done. Between the antenna and the shack is an actual uh, length of coax that is a one half wavelength electrical length. So not a physical length, but electrically one quarter wave long at 3750. So whatever I'm measuring here is what's up at the trend, up at the feed point. So at around 3600 or 3.6 megahertz, the SWR is three. At around 3.9 megahertz, it's three. And at resonance, it's uh, 3750, it's about 1.4 uh, relative to uh, SWR, relative to 50 ohms. When I measured it with the noise bridge and then converted all those measurements to SWR, that's how it fit. So we see it's uh, done, uh, it's pretty well worked out the way we thought it would in terms of cutting it to size and so on. By the way, I still have the noise bridge, but now I find it's a little easier to work with a real impedance meter. 
So how did the antenna turn out? Well, it works very reliably for uh, distant uh, stations, those that are uh, well beyond uh, uh, 500 or 700 miles from me, out to the east coast and out to the west coast. And by reliably, I mean that the signals uh, uh, can be heard all the time. And they can hear me, uh, Q5, more than 70% of the time at the most distant spot. And it's almost 100% in place uh, nearer than that. Um, the half square does perform better than that ground plane vertical did or does presently. The problem is working uh, reliably those nearby stations, 50 to 100 miles. The reliability can be as low as only 50 percent. So what has to be done here is actually use two antennas to work uh, coast to coast. So the lessons learned are you need two antennas to work coast to coast <laughs> uh, for this particular uh, net control station. Uh, that the theoretical natural radiation patterns and angles uh, fit together. So that's good to know that the theory fits the actual and vice versa. Uh, most of our communication circuits that we're talking about between, let's say, St. John's, Newfoundland and me, or Toronto and me, and out to the West Coast and me, are up in the 70% reliability. Uh, uh, so that's pretty good reliability depending on uh, Propagation, I can't do much more than that. Um, the far distances, it drops down to 50% reliability that I am Q5. I can be Q4 or Q3, uh, but still I'm not quite making it in there 100% or even 70% of the time, so I've got to think of something else. The other lesson learned is that uh, I've learned something and that the system approach uh, has been confirmed again. We don't have time to talk about this, but high frequency terrain assessment uh, is something you all should look into if you have uh, the opportunity. Uh, it works for horizontal antennas and not too well at all for vertical antennas. So I'm going to just skip past that and go to the conclusion and uh, uh, just reflect on the fact that we've talked about antenna system planning. And we evaluated some candidate antennas. We picked one, the half square, and we implemented. What's next at this QTH? Well, I'm, I tried it as a half square array on 20, and it works fine and dandy. Uh, a one built for 20. Now I'm thinking of putting two up at right angles to each other so I can switch to uh, different directions. And we'll see how that works. So now I turn it over to you folks, and it's your turn. Uh, Ken, it's all, all yours. Go ahead. Okay, Bill. Very good. Thank you much. Um, okay, if you've got any questions for Bill, go ahead and uh, fire those in now, and uh, we'll take those questions. Um, one thing I wanted to add, you mentioned HFTA there at the end. Um, uh, Dean Straw has done a couple of webinars uh, on HFTA. He's the author of that. I believe they are on the um, Potomac Valley Radio Club website at www dot pvrc dot org. Uh, I would check that first, or else um, www dot wwrof dot org. Um, I'm just checking because it, PVRC used to sponsor the webinars, and there's a bunch of the archives on their web page. And I think uh, that time frame was uh, about when uh, Deaton did his presentation. So, um, as Bill said, lots of good stuff on HFTA and. Uh, worth uh, checking out. So, well, um, okay, here we go. Oh, one other thing I should mention, too. If you uh, send in a question, if you wouldn't mind, just put your call sign with it. Um, that uh, helps me. Um, question from Ray is, how did you uh, compute the two skip uh, radiation angles? Okay, Ray, that's a uh, good question. And uh, what I'll do here uh, is I'll, I think I can sit back. There might even be a better way to do this. <laughs> I use that uh, chart and um, uh, that graph that we were looking at. Let me just go back till I find it. I was using um, uh, this one. This is in uh, the antenna handbook produced by ARRL. It's also been in some uh, IEEE publications from back in the 30s, 1930s. And uh, so I knew my distances that I had to cover 
uh, you remember one of the distances was about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the 1,250 mile distance. So I just uh, plotted it on this chart here. So I ran from the single hop distance uh, at the bottom there, I put it around 1,200, ran it up to the top of the F2 layer, and then across to the uh, left. And it came out at 30 degrees as the radiation angle uh, to hit that distance. And if I'm at the bottom of the F2 layer, the lowest uh, level of it, uh, did the same thing, and it comes out to someplace around 17 or 18 degrees. And then I did the same thing again uh, for the distance that was uh, uh, 2,000 uh, miles. And then I plugged it into, uh, I actually did it for each of my key locations. So I took that, I took this chart with those distances and plotted them on here and then transferred their radiation angles over to here. And that's how I got those radiation angles and the uh, distances. First of all, I measured the distances, then I used the chart to get the radiation angle. Okay, um, got one more question here. It comes from Scott, K0 Mike Delta. Hey, Scott. Um, he says, uh, why not do a four square and feed the coax going into the dummy load into a dipole, which would give you two, anten two antennas simultaneously? Oh, why not do the four square on 20 meters? Is that what he means? Uh, possibly. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> and, you know, as I was saying that to you a few moments ago, I thought, gee whiz, why don't I do a four square? <laughs> so, Scott, you and I are in the same wavelength. You can come up here and we can start stretching wire anytime. Uh, he's a native of Minnesota. He likes the snow, so it shouldn't be a problem. Well, he's close by. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, listen, uh, we've uh, pretty much run out of time here. Um, uh, well, let me just see here. If, uh, okay, uh, one more question. Uh, I'll, I'll take this one um, from David. Um, I work Europe from the East Coast, USA, with an apex uh, delta loop. And the apex is at 60 foot high. Antennas fed a quarter wave down from the apex. I believe you said you do not have two tall supports, but one may give one may give you more reliability at distances you want greater than two thousand miles. Does that sound right? You know, um, I think you're going in the right direction. There's uh, two fellows who are now on the uh, powwow club uh, in the evenings, and I think they're both on the west coast of uh, Canada. And they're using delta loops and um, at 64 feet at the apex. And they are very, very loud at my location. So I think you're, you're using the right antenna for the, for the chart. OK, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab the presentation roll from you. You don't need to do anything, Bill. Um, screen, and well, here we go. Uh, anyways, I wanted to thank you, Bill, for an excellent presentation. Um, was was perfect. Uh, audio quality and everything was was uh, spectacular the uh, whole way through. Is there anything else you wanted to add here before we uh, close it up? Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, I don't know if they can see my screen anymore, but uh, if they wish, they can look me up on qrz.com, and if they need to ask questions that way, they can uh, email me. And Ken, thank you very much for hosting, and thank you all out there for uh, uh, signing up for the webinar. You bet. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly that we have an excellent presentation coming up on March 19th. Very excited about this one, Cost Contesting Tips for Little Pistols. Um, Dan has given this numbers of times at uh, club meetings and so on, a very popular presentation. Um, the registration link has not been posted on the WWROF web page yet, but it will be there, or you can email me the ad address there, and I will uh, send you the uh, registration link. But uh, I think that will be a, a very popular one, and uh, please uh, pass the word. Also, uh, go ahead and uh, check out the WWROF uh, web page, as we always encourage you to do. So with that, thank you again, Bill. Great to have you. I hope we can get you back another time, and uh, thanks, everyone, for attending this presentation, and hopefully uh, we'll see you on the 19th. Uh, take care. 73s. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.